wonderful. It's uh, three minutes after six and uh, we will begin. Uh, hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all and an especially warm welcome to our esteemed guest, Kenny Free. My name is Dorota Glowaka. I'm a professor at the University of King's College. I will be moderating this evening's event. I will begin by acknowledging that the University of King's College, which is hosting this event, is sitting in Chabaktak, otherwise known as Halifax. We are located in Mi'kma'ki, the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. Uh, this territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which the Mi'kmaq, Wolastiquik, and Passamaquoddy peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1725. Uh, today, these treaties are the basis of peaceful coexistence between all who live here today and who study here at the University of King's College. And now I have the pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker, Kenny Fries, an American writer, poet, memoirist, activist, museum curator, and a renowned scholar in the areas of disability and queer theory. And, and a wonderful person whom I had the pleasure of meeting in Berlin uh, four years and one month ago, to be exact at a Holocaust conference that was uh, dedicated to the subject of sexuality and the Holocaust. And I've been meaning to invite him to King's ever since. Uh, so you can say that uh, this event has been very long in the making. Um, Kenny Fries is the author of the memoir in the province of the gods, which came out in 2017 uh, and which is based on his experiences as a Fulbright scholar in Japan. And uh, that book received the Creative Capital Literature Award. Uh, Kenny Fries is also the author of The History of My Shoes and the Evolution of Darwin's Theory uh, that came out in 2007. And it is an autobiographical take on Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace's conception of the survival of the fittest. And uh, that book received the Outstanding Book Award from Gustavus Meyer's Center for the Study of Bigotry and Human Rights. And you can also read his earlier memoir, Body Remember, as well as an edited volume, Staring Back, the Disability Experience from the Inside Out. Uh, and that's a collection of fiction, nonfiction, and, and poems about experiences of people with uh, disabilities. As I said, Kenny Fries is also a poet and his poems include volumes uh, in the gardens of Japan, desert working, walking, and anesthesia. And at the moment, he's working on a book manuscript uh, entitled Stumbling Over History, uh, Disability and the Holocaust. Uh, and uh, the excerpts from that book, um, as we are awaiting uh, its publication, uh, have appeared in, in various publications, uh, including the New York Times. And uh, that they are also the basis for a video series um, entitled um, What Happened Here in the Summer of 1940. And uh, please uh, find, find it on, on his website, www.kennyfreeze.com. Uh, Kenny Freeze is currently busy curating an exhibit on disability and queerness at the Berlin Schwulers Museum, or queer, queer museum. And uh, if you ever go to Berlin, that museum definitely should be at the top of your list of places uh, to visit. Uh, I, this is the shortest I could do to introduce tonight's guest. Uh, Kenny Fries is joining us tonight from Berlin. Uh, the time difference uh, between Berlin and uh, Chebaktak is five hours. So uh, it is 11 p.m. Berlin time now, and uh, we are even more appreciative that uh, you are joining us at such a late hour. Uh, let me acknowledge that this event has been organized by the Contemporary Studies Program at the University of King's College in collaboration with the Foundation Year Program and History of Science and Technology Program. Uh, also, which are also at King's uh, Gender and Women's Studies Program at Dalhousie University and the Office of the Equity Officer at King's. So thank you for being such enthusiastic and, and general, generous partners on this event. And before we move to our main event, uh, let me just quickly explain the format. 
after the presentation, which will uh, last about 35 to 40 minutes, uh, we will have a Q&A, uh, probably for about half an hour. <clears throat> so we would like to conclude uh, at 7.30 Eastern time at the very latest. Uh, so please prepare your questions. Put, if you have the Q&A chat function at the bottom of your screen. So please uh, put your questions in the Q&A chat, which I will moderate. Uh, I will uh, read your question to the speaker uh, in order that they arrive. And I hope we'll be able to read all of them. Uh, and, and you can let me know if you'd like to be identified by name and, and then I can read it. Uh, also, uh, at the bottom of your screen, you see the raise hand button. And if you'd rather speak than send in uh, a message, a uh, type message in the Q&A, please uh, use the raise hand button and then we can enable the speaking function. Uh, and I will, I will read your name and then you will be able to, uh, uh, to, to read your question. Uh, uh, accessibility for this event is provided by sign language interpreters, and I'd like to thank them for assisting us tonight. I'd also like to thank Elizabeth McElroy and Lucy Boyd from King's, who've been helping with every aspect of organizing this event. Thank you. Uh, Kenny Fries has agreed to have this event recorded. Uh, and uh, I believe that those of us who are on the screen will have to press the agree button. And thank you, Kenny, for allowing us to record this event. And now, please welcome tonight's guest, Kenny Priest. Hello, everyone. Um, I still, after doing this for two years, I still think it's so strange to, uh, to see myself in the, when I look at the screen. So thank you, thank you so much, Dorota, for putting this together. And yeah, it was over four years ago that, that we met. And thanks to Elizabeth and Lucy for all their, their assistance in making tonight happen. So I'm gonna, re, I'm gonna talk and read from various, uh, various works and probably take maybe a half hour, 35 minutes. I never know how long it takes. Um, and then we'll open it up, as, as Georgia said, for, for questions. So if you have questions as you go along, uh, don't wait. I mean, put them, put them down in the, in the question and answer uh, chat so we, you, know, you can then just pay attention <laughs> and listen and enjoy. Um, though enjoy is a very strange um, word to use with the work that I write. Okay, so um, we're titling tonight's uh, talk, Disability Can Save Your Life, Queering the Crip, Cripping the Queer, which is kind of a mashup of two things that I've, one I've worked on and one I am working on. Um, Disability Can Save Your Life is an audio text, which I will play for you as part of the presentation a little bit later. And Queering the Crip, Cripping the Queer is a, an exhibit that I'm co-curating for the Schulis Museum we're hoping to open in August um, 2022, but it's always been it's been postponed. It's supposed to happen in February, so uh, originally, but with the pandemic and all that stuff, things keep getting getting moved. So I'm going to start off by reading the very very short beginning to Body Remember. Those afternoons, I did not take the bus and chose to walk home from high school. I would find this boy, maybe 10 or 11 years old, sitting on the stoop of the semi-detached house where I imagined he lived. Every time I passed, this boy asked, why your legs the way they are? And I would answer, I was born that way, never stopping or slowing down. The next time I walked down that street, there this boy was, sitting on the stoop. And again, he asked me his same question and I gave him my same answer. That was the entirety of our exchange. Every time I walked down Bay 43rd Street in Brooklyn, shortly after three in the afternoon, that boy and that question would be waiting for me. Never did I think of answering him in any other way or not to answer him at all. 
nor did I ever stop to talk to him. And never did it occur to me that I could walk down another street, not see this boy and evade his question. The questions the boys asked are not my questions, not the questions I want my life or my work to answer, but the questions I am seemingly forced to answer by others, as well as by the historically scripted cultural narrative of disability. Thus, my life and my work is set against the received narrative of disability. As I write in the history of my shoes and the evolution of Darwin's theory, similar to its attitude toward homosexuality in our culture demands explanation about most disabilities. The writer Joan Tollefson, who has one arm, has likened this question, what happened to your arm, to a koan mantra that follows her through life. When we speak of disability, we associate it with a story, place it in a narrative. A person became deaf, became blind, was born deaf, was born blind, became quadriplegic. The impairment becomes part of a sequential narrative. By doing this, we think of disability as linked to individualism and the individual story. What is actually a physical fact becomes a story with a hero or a victim. Disability becomes divorced from cultural context and becomes the problem of the individual, not a category defined by the society. The dialectic of normalcy, for someone to be normal, someone has to be not normal, is kept intact. Tonight, queerness is also in the house. I am currently co-curating curating, Queering the Crip, Cripping the Queer, an exhibit on queer disability history and art scheduled to open at the Schulis Museum Berlin in August. The title of the exhibit comes from Queering the Crip or Cripping the Queer, Intersections of Queer and Crip Identities in Solo Autobiographical Performance, an article by Carrie Sandall, director of the Program on Disability, Art and Culture and Humanities at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and co-director of Bodies of Work, a network of disability art and culture. Now I'm gonna give you a bit of my writing history. In the summer of 1989, when I began searching for the words with which to begin speaking about my own experience living with a congenital disability, most of what I found was filled with myths, metaphors, and lies. What I found were stereotypes. What I found were cliches. I began to take the initial steps of finding the language, unearthing the images, shaping the forms with which I could express an experience I had never read about before, so that my experience as a person with a disability could become meaningful to others. What I remember about that summer of 1989 is wanting to throw all those drafts away, not thinking them poems, not having a role model in whose steps I could follow, unsure of my own identity as both a writer and as a person who lives with a disability. I felt like a shadow spirit, unable to meld successfully on the page the non-disabled world I lived in with my experience of being disabled in that world. Not only was I writing about my life as a disabled man that transformed this experience in which others, disabled and non-disabled alike, could see themselves, I was also writing about my life as a gay man. Being that a disabled man has been traditionally viewed as asexual, and that a gay man has been traditionally being viewed as overly sexual, this was luckily a difficult stereotype to live up to. Here in an excerpt from the opening chapter of Body Remember, I fuse my queer and disabled identities, which I think fulfills my quest for a language equal to the task 
of creating on the page a queer disabled identity. I'm going to edit this section a little bit, so it's not exactly as it's been in the as it is in the book. It is cloudy, and I think our planned night trip to the beach will not be worthwhile. But as Kevin and I make our way from the parking lot, past the closed concession stand and out onto the beach, the clouds are a curtain rising as it parts. By the time we have spread our large blanket on the sand, the haze has moved beyond the horizon, revealing the star-filled sky. It is the midsummer night when the meteor showers will be most active. The night when, if it is clear, it will be easiest to see the shooting stars. When our eyes adjust to the dark, we begin to discern other couples who, like us, have left indoor comfort behind and lie on their backs, open to the elements, awaiting the beginning of the show. Some, farther down, have lit small fires. Triangles of orange flicker down the beach. We listen to the tide, hear other people laughing. Soon, after Kevin spots the first sudden flash of light, we are laughing too laughing and pointing to the next star and the next, and the next traveling in an instant, the entire arc of the visible sky. Before the mere flash it takes each star to burst across the galaxy, extinguishing itself as it advances, another has begun its momentary flight. It has always been difficult for me to comprehend how the stars are sending light from so many years ago that it took four days for the space shuttle's transmissions of Neptune's likeness to reach awaiting eyes on Earth seems to me unfathomable. The speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, has always been as incomprehensible to my mind as the distance between the Earth and the stars. Tonight, lying on the beach, Kevin's hand in mine, I begin to name the stars, not the constellations. Even when Kevin points them out to me, even when I say I can see them, the truth is I cannot distinguish the Big Dipper from Orion, one cluster of stars from another. Instead, I call out Shirley, the nickname for my friend Cheryl. Kevin calls out Marsha, the name of another friend. Soon we are naming every flash of light, using the names of our friends' ex-boyfriends, and when we run out of them, we use our own. Polio, spina bifida, cerebral palsy, I hear myself naming out loud, diseases that in another world, a world in which the connotations of disability are not pejorative, would be perfect names for shooting stars. Tonight, Looking at the sky, I know what it is I want to do. I want to be in an open space and feel Kevin's body close to mine as we look around us, sharing what is happening this very moment before our eyes. But on this clear night, I am able not only to understand the clarity, the intimacy, both physical and intangible, that two different people can share, but at the same time, I can see once again moving from the horizon onto the shore, the haze that only hours ago made it unlikely that we would be able to witness the stars. Kevin's hand feels cold on my skin. As we watch the sky, and I'm missing a page. <laughs> Let's do that again. Um, as I watch the stars, his hand mindlessly moves up and down my leg. The second finger on his left hand begins to play with one of the holes adjoining the scar just above where my right foot just out at almost 90 degrees from my leg. Suddenly, involuntarily, I jump. 
What's the matter? Kevin asks. I take a deep breath and the warm night air gets caught in my throat. I taste sand and ocean salt, but all I can smell is ether, the antiseptic odor that pervaded Dr. Milgram's crowded waiting room, writing room to his hospital office when I was young. How do I explain to Kevin the enormous respect I had for my orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Joseph Milgram? How do I describe the people from all over the world who sat with me in that fluorescently lit linoleum tiled waiting room? How do I begin to tell him how Dr. Milgram made me feel special? Kevin watches the stars. I want to tell him why I, ju why I jumped. I want to tell him about the disagreement between Dr. Milgram and the resident doctor, how in 1970, after the major five hour reconstructive surgery on my right foot and leg, during which my foot was connected to my leg only by a single blood vessel near where he had been touching, my leg held in position by two pins, was heavily bandaged, but not put in a cast. When the resident made his rounds, he put the bandaged leg in a plastic bag. When Dr. Milgram came the next day, he took it off saying that it needed to breathe. The next day, the resident put the bag back on and Dr. Milgram on his next visit took it off. I want to tell Kevin how these two men, supposedly working together so I could walk better, did not agree on the best way to lessen the chance of infection in my leg. I want to tell Kevin when I, why I jumped when his finger grazed that hole. I want him to know that when the pins were removed, Dr. Milgram at first insisted that it could be done without anesthetics. I want to be able to describe the pain when that was tried, how it still racks my body when the holes where the pins were inserted are touched. I want Kevin to know that the next day when the pins were successfully removed, I was in the operating room under anesthesia. I want to tell him that even though Dr. Milgram did not know what caused my legs to be deformed, I needed to trust him. I want Kevin to know that despite any mistake he, Kevin, might make, something harmful he might say or do, I want to trust him as I trusted my doctor. I want to tell Kevin that although I am no longer young and that I understand more with each passing year, I am still afraid. Afraid that after all these years, after all the surgery, after all the psychotherapy, some wounds can never heal, that some wounds are actually the scars. An hour later, we are driving the short distance back to my house where only a few weeks ago, Kevin came to spend the summer with me. I feel his hand on my neck. Barely over five feet tall, I cannot reach the gas pedal or the brake with my legs. So I use hand controls to drive, a simple metal lever up and toward me for gas, down and away for brake. My left hand on the controls, my right hand steering. When driving, I have little time, except when stopped at a red light or on longer drives when I could hold the hand controls and steady the steering wheel at the same time to hold my lover's hand. Instead, I push my head back into Kevin's palm. Wrote that a very long time ago. Um, okay, so I began to unearth work that once published quickly became a canon of contemporary writing about disability, by writers with disabilities in the United States, which became staring back the disability, the anthology, the disability experience from the inside out. By this time, I had also learned enough and matured enough as a writer to negotiate the spaces between the double stereotype of being both gay and disabled. Body Remember was the first memoir that looked at the life of a gay man with a disability in the United States, which along with Staring Back was published in 1997. By this time, I had gravitated towards the work of Adrian Rich. I noticed that in her contradictions tracking poems, she was writing about physical pain. 
At the time, I thought these poems only metaphorically alluded to physical disability. But attending a rich reading in the Bay Area, I noticed the presence of her plain lucite cane. I learned that Rich was in fact disabled due to severe arthritis. In diving into the wreck, Rich writes about a book of myths in which our names do not appear. And in contradiction tracking poems, Rich writes, the problem unstated till now is how to live in a damaged body in a world where pain is meant to be gagged, uncured, ungrieved over. The problem is to connect without hysteria, the pain of anyone's body with the pain of the body's world. In staring back, I proudly added Rich to my canon of disabled writers, which led to a nourishing acquaintance and correspondence during which I became a role model vis-a-vis -vis disability for the elder rich. The problem is to connect without hysteria, the pain of anyone's body with the pain of the body's world. This is something I've thought about a lot during the pandemic. At the beginning of the pandemic, hearing about what was happening to disabled people, the triage protocols, and how the elderly and disabled were talked about as being expendable, brought up the specter of eugenics, something I know a lot about because for the past seven years, I've been working on stumbling over history, disability and the Holocaust, which looks at Action T4, the Nazi program that mass murdered disabled people and its resonance today. For months, I couldn't write when the, after the pandemic began. All I could do was let as many people know about what was happening to disabled people by sharing articles on Facebook and through email. Finally, in June 2020, thanks to a commission for a gallery exhibit that had to go virtual, I wrote and recorded the audio text, Disability Can Save Your Life, Well, I will play for you now. And for accessibility reasons, it comes with, um, with the text. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to share sound, which is something I always forget. Okay, it's around four minutes. Disability can save your life for Stacy Park. The guideline said, if you have to go to the doctor, do not take public transportation, do not take a taxi. I thought, this presumes you're in walking distance to your doctor or you own a car. On Facebook, a friend posted, someone in his New York City elevator building had the virus. If he did not have a dog, he would take the stairs. I thought many of my disabled friends could not take the stairs. We are told, do not come into close contact with others. I thought many of my disabled friends require multiple assistance each day to live their lives. My hard of hearing friend said, I cannot hear my friend if we walk one and a half meters apart. I cannot read lips through a mask. I read there are accessible masks that use see-through coverings of one's mouth. The crisis triage protocol for Alabama said, withhold treatment for anyone with an intellectual disability. I thought, eugenics. The crisis protocol for New York State said, take away ventilators from those who use them in their daily lives. I thought, I always knew disabled lives were not deemed worthy. My friend in California said, she can no longer get the medicine she uses to regulate lupus. I thought, there are many ways they will kill us. I also thought of this, the 9-11 story in the third part of my book, In the Province of the Gods. I know I read the story, but I can't remember where I read it. 
A woman in one of the towers was injured. Someone, a fireman, a co-worker, I don't remember, found her and began to lead her down the stairs. Even though she knew time was running out, even though her would-be rescuer kept telling her there was no time to stop, the pain in the woman's leg forced her to stop. She could not go on without resting. She stopped with the rescuer on a stairway landing, near a doorway. While they waited on the landing, the stairway beneath them burst into flames and began to collapse. The rescuer grabbed her and pushed her through the doorway. They found another intact stairway, which led them to safety. If she hadn't stopped to catch her breath, if she hadn't been injured and her leg didn't hurt as much as it did, we would have both been on that burning stairway. We would have died for sure when it collapsed, the rescuer said. We were told disabled students and disabled faculty could not be given accommodations to work online. Now we are told we must learn and teach online. We have always said we do not want to live in institutions such as nursing homes. You now know the dangers of nursing homes where thousands have died. We are told we cannot have anyone with us in the hospital. We know it is dangerous to be left in the hospital alone. We are told you are vulnerable, you are disposable. I know the Disability Justice Culture Club, a collective of disabled and neurodivergent queer people of color, believes in mutual aid. They distribute sanitary kits to the homeless. We know disability can save your life. Okay, so that's disability can save your life. So what I learned during the early days of the pandemic, pandemic was something that increasingly has become obvious to me as I work on stumbling over history. Eugenics, which, has been, which was, had been rampant in the US, Canada, and the UK was alive and well and predates the Nazis. In 1923, Dr. Ewald Meltzer surveyed the parents of his disabled patients. He was surprised to find that 73% of the parents responded that it would be okay to kill their disabled children if they didn't know about it. Earlier in 1920, psychiatrist Albert Hocha and jurist Carl Binding published their treatise, Allowing the Destruction of Life Unworthy of Living which was used by the Nazis as a blueprint for Action T4. Even during the rollout of vaccinations during the pandemic, the disregard and misunderstanding of disabled lives was prevalent. I always knew the medical model of disability, which focused on the individual and the body, not the body's world, the world in which a body lives, was the way society and culture looked at those with disabilities. In the medical model, overcoming one's disability, seen as an individual's problem, the eradication of disability, cure it or kill it, was the outcome. This should not have been a surprise, and in a way it wasn't, but the fourth which it hit me during the pandemic was surprising. On July 20, 20, in July 2016, in Sagi Mahara, Japan, 19 disabled people were killed and another 26 injured, 13 severely, at a care home for the disabled. A former employee of the home was the killer. He wanted to legalize the killing of disabled people when asked to do so by their guardians. He said this would be good for Japan and world peace, as well as help prevent World War III. The echoes of my research into Action T4 was clearly evident even before the pandemic. When I published the Nazis' first victims were the disabled in the New York Times in 2017, I knew this, but during the pandemic, this became increasingly more so. In stumbling over history, I make two leaps in how I could best look at Action T4 
and its place in disability history. The first is to write from the perspective of what Suzanne Knittel and other memory study scholars call the vicarious witness. In my 2020 article in the New York Times, before the final solution, there was a test killing, which is about the test killing of the disabled at Brandenburg on de Havel in January, 1940. I write, unlike the Holocaust, there are no T4 survivors. We know about T4 and its aftermath, mainly through medical records and from perpetrators. Action T4, does not have its Elie Wiesel or Primo Levi. That is the main reason I write about what happened to disabled people during the Third Reich. I want to be what Suzanne C. Knittel and other scholars call a vicarious witness. Ms. Knittel describes this not as an act of speaking for and thus appropriating the memory and story of someone else, but rather an attempt to bridge the silence through narrative means. This is my way of bridging the silence, of keeping alive something that is too often forgotten. And because, as, as because there are no T4 survivors, and as Knittel does, I write from the perspective of multi-directional memory, not equating, but making connections between other times in disability history like I did previously looking at the Meltzer survey. But I also look forward, for example, the idea of protest or lack of protest. I began to make connections between the lack of public protest about the killing of disabled people during T4 with that of the early HIV AIDS years. If we were to give every disabled person then living in Germany, parents, aunts, uncles, cousins, friends, there would be millions. Similarly, during the early HIV AIDS years, if we gave each person living with AIDS, parents, aunts, uncles, cousins, friends, there would be mil millions. But it was only when people with AIDS themselves took to the streets, especially in the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, ACT UP, that made public protest happen. During the current coronavirus pandemic, I've often asked myself and others, where are the mass protests about those who died in nursing homes, group homes, and other institutions? A majority of those who have died of COVID have been in these institutions. Yet there has been no mass protest about this. And where is the research on the effect of COVID on those living with HIV? So how did we get to this situation? I propose the misunderstanding and fear of disabled lives is, is, is based in, if not based in, is then promulgated by how disability and those with disabilities are represented in our culture. As I wrote in the introduction to Staring Back in 1997, and as I mentioned at the start as earlier, disability has more often been seen as used as a metaphor. And when an actual disabled life is depicted, it follows the medical model where the disability needs to be cured or killed. I won't go into the history of disability representation here, but just think about the characters throughout our literature and films, from Oedipus to Richard III to James Bond villains, signified as evil by a disability, to movies where the purpose of a disabled character is to educate a non-disabled character, think Rain Man. If not to win an Oscar for a non-disabled actor playing a disabled character. Think about the still present narrative trope of queer people dying or being killed. So I created the Freeze Test, which looks at how a more accurate disability representation might occur. In order to pass the Freeze Test, we have to ask, does a work have more than one disabled character? Do the disabled characters have their own narrative purpose other than the education and profit of a non-disabled character? Is the character's disability not eradicated either by curing or killing? 
so as a, as a side note, which isn't in my prepared um, talk, is that um, when I published the freeze test, um, uh, Nicola Griffith, uh, a writer, uh, wrote an article in the Times uh, that referenced, uh, she had put on her website uh, asking people what became, you know, what, what works would have passed the freeze test. And she uh, did some statistical counting um, that there should be millions because of how many disabled people there are on the world. But people came up with around 67, I think it was. Um, so that was interesting. So the problems continue. Just look at the popular film, Me Before You, where the rich disabled character decides it is better for him to die and give his money to his non-disabled girlfriend, or the theater adaptation of Nobel Prize winning Jose Saramago's novel, Blindness, in which blindness is a metaphor, a contagion to be feared. Knowing how mainstream critics and artists do not know about the rich histories of disability culture, I recently began a three-year project funding by the Canada Council for the Arts and published by Word Gathering called Disability Futures in the Arts, in which I've invited a group of disabled writers and artists to write essays about the work they've looked to, their own practices, and how they see the best way forward for disability culture. The second cohort of five artists was published just recently in December, and, um, and the first was the December before then. And you can find that um, on Word Gathering's uh, website, wordgathering.com. And in the province of the gods, my most recently published book, my queer disabled life is once again fused, but in the context of Japanese history and culture. So I'm gonna end my talk from giving two examples of how I've attempted and hopefully succeeded in escaping the narrative tropes of disability. In this short chapter from the history of my shoes and the evolution of Darwin's theory, it happens after a trip down the, Grand, the Colorado River in the Grand Canyon, a trip I took with a group of disabled people. And I begin to see much of what we use, what is taken for granted, including boats, as an adaptation. Here in this chapter, you'll see what I learned. So this is part of a chapter called Radiant not blinding light from, in the, uh, from the history of my shoes and the evolution of Darwin's theory. The early morning sun reflects off the driveway through my bedroom window. Occasionally I hear a car pass slowly down the street. It must be between six and seven o'clock in the morning. I cannot tell whether I have been awake or asleep the past few hours. All I know, is that I am extremely tired. The coolness of the sheets on my feet reminds me I am back home in my bed. The past two months, I have been unable to put my left foot on the ground without pain. From my bed, I can look out at the empty driveway. I see the just risen sun reflecting off the asphalt outside my bedroom window. I close my eyes, take a deep breath, then another, my usual way of trying to reduce my rapid heartbeat. I begin to count my breaths. One, breathe in, breathe out. Two, breathe in, breathe out. A simple meditation with which I am sometimes able to calm my body. Three, breathe in, breathe out. And when I open my eyes, am I dreaming? The orange robe monks I watched each morning in Bangkok are making their procession up my driveway. Without looking, I know each monk, every one of them, is not wearing shoes. My driveway becomes Rama IV, Siloam, Yayarawat, all the streets of Bangkok, all the streets of Thailand where every early morning over 100,000 orange row barefoot monks walk on Bintabat through village and city streets carrying only their bot, black alms bowls, in which families, young and old, place rice and curries for the monks to take to eat back at their monasteries. This is their only source of food. I get out of bed and put on my padded slippers, child size, 
brought from Gap Kids to wear around the house and minimize the pain in my foot when I'm cooking. I go to my bedroom closet, slide open the closet door. My LPs are still wrapped, bound together with newspaper, an easy way of transport devised when I move to Northampton. On the top shelf, a white cardboard box. Instantly, I remember that last attempt at having new shoes made, now over three years ago. I take down the box and open it. In the hours between midnight and dawn, I put on what I thought then would be my new shoes. Slowly, making sure my left foot doesn't hurt, I walk through each room of my house, putting on the lights. When I reach the kitchen, every light in the house is glowing, refracting off the yellow gold walls. Standing in the kitchen in my would-be new shoes, I am taller. I see corners of the kitchen counters I don't usually see. I open a cupboard and I reach up to a shelf I usually can't reach. Eye to eye with the toaster oven, beneath the latticed metal tray, I see the looped metal elements. When I turn the toaster on, the elements slowly turn a deep orange and I realize that this appliance that I have taken for granted is not a given, but in its adaptation for the way we live now. So is the refrigerator, the stove, even the table and chairs, all that evolutionary backbake we avoid by not sitting on the ground in the middle of the room. Plates, gold to match the color of the walls, ceramic bowls, also gold, forks and knives. I'm opening all the drawers, cups, mugs and glasses, water pitcher, empty recyclable bottles. I'm in my office, the computer, the fax machine, bookshelves, the calendar, the books, the printed letters on the book's pages, the living room, the television, the carpet, the sofa, evolutionary backache again avoided again, the lamps, the candles, the bathroom, the towels, the soap, shampoo, the toilet, the sink, the shower, the plumbing invisible inside the walls, the sewage system, the electrical wiring, everything in my entire house, the entire house itself, everything as it is, but everything an adaptation. The bedroom, the phone, the newspapers and magazines, the windows, the double arched bed, backache once again avoided by adaptation. But a sharp pain travels from my left foot up my leg. I know it is time to take off my shoes. Back to the closet, again the LPs, for the past 10 years of very little use, vestigial organs. I put away the shoes. It is just past now, just past dawn, and I am exhausted. Back in bed, I close my eyes and wonder if the orange robe monks are again traipsing up my driveway. Bright orange changes to burnt orange and the old blind monk priest dressed in his burnt orange robes. I wonder if he's still alive. As if in answer, the old blind monk gives way to another elderly man, the aging artist, Henri Matisse. Why Matisse? What's he doing in my bedroom? Darwin, each of us at some period of life, during some season of the year, has to struggle for life and to su suffer great destruction. In 1941, Matisse was 72. Cancer surgery had left him with a prolapsed sub stomach, so he had to wear an iron belt, making it increasingly painful for him to stand for more than an hour at a time. Two years later, stones in Matisse's bile duct triggered jaundice that from time to time caused him to stay in bed for long periods of time. Many times he woke up in the middle of the night and awake in bed remembered the past. The cutouts of 1943 are the first works that Matisse confined to his bed, worked on at night. How could he paste his, his, how could he paste his gouache colored cutouts on the paper so high on his studio wall? Unlike the photographic record of FDR, 
there are many photographs of Matisse in his wheelchair. There are also photographs of Matisse's assistants helping him with his work. Darwin, each man would soon learn that if he aided his fellow men, he would commonly receive aid in return. Always interested in the border between drawing and color, Matisse began to draw in color, replacing the brush and pencil with scissors during the last decade of his life. His experience with the cutout spiritually rejuvenated him. He saw the advantage of having, bat, having had both his illness and the surgery, saying it made him feel young again. He didn't want to take for granted his new lease on life. To Matisse, this was a second life, and the work he did before his illness and surgery smacked of too much effort. In his new work, he felt he represented himself as free, detached. Matisse likened the second life to flying, as a plane trip helps both to forget and to find peace of mind, which makes everything possible. What mattered to him was to find joy in the sky. This is the radiant but not blinding light with which he longed to infuse his work. His bodily impairment gave him the impression that he was indeed floating in this radiant light throughout the remainder of his life. Somewhere in these hours, I know that I, like Matisse, can adapt to the circumstances in which my body places me. Like Matisse, I can learn from my disability experience. Darwin, no one supposes that all the individuals of the same species are cast in the very same mold. These individual differences are highly important for us as they afford materials for natural selection to accumulate. As the world's various cultures continue to evolve, who knows what will help us survive? I think I'll end there. I went over a little bit. So um, thank you for, for listening and um, going back and forth <laughs> with me as I um, think associatively and write associatively, um, but it all comes together in the end. Tarota, back to you. <laughs> oh, my goodness, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny. Oh, I see questions are coming in. So let me just jump right in. The first is this. <clears throat> this is uh, from a person who is in gender and women studies department and saying, in the, the department, uh, we talk a lot about internalized misogyny and what we can do in our everyday lives as well as through our interactions to unlearn this way of thinking. How do you think we can unlearn internalized ableism? <laughs> oh, that's a very good question. Um, I think that um, I'll start off by saying I think that I think it's probably one of the one of the most uh, difficult things to unlearn. Um, and I think it, my own internalized ableism, um, if you look at my work from Body Remember to my current work, it's it's really it's really moved along the, along the con the continuum. Um, but the, the the first thing is to learn about disabled lives and what they're actually like, that they're not metaphors, that they're not stereotypes, um, uh, that there are aunts and mothers and fathers and cousins and friends, um, and uh, to look at the privileges that that one has. I mean, I think I, I broached a few of them at the beginning of, uh, of, the, of the audio text, Disability Can Save Your Life. I mean, during people look, I mean, looking at one's privileges is really, really difficult. And at the beginning, you, they were, we were being told not to, you know, not to use public transportation and not to use, you know, um, it, you know, it's, it's a walk to our doctors. Well, there's some, there's people in the world that can't walk to their doctors. There's also people in the world that don't have doctors. Um, so just look at the, the way your life is, is, is privileged and that, you know, situates you in, in an able, we're all, we all live in an ableist culture, just like we live in a racist culture and a misogynistic culture. 
And so it's becoming aware of these things that are that are that encompass ableism, reading, taking classes, knowing disabled people. Um, those are just a, a start. Great, thank you. Well, we also have comments. Thank you so much, bravo, with uh, with many exclamation <laughs> marks. Thank you. Oh, uh, let me just uh, keep going. Uh, what, uh, what does poetic writing or associative writing allow you to say or to express than a more conventional treatise or analysis might not? Um, well, I think that, I mean, the first thing that's interesting is I, I first started out in theater. Um, my graduate degree is actually in theater and I started writing poems way before I started writing nonfiction. And I turned to nonfiction when I felt that my poems or at least the way I wrote poems couldn't hold the socio-political context that I wanted my work to hold and address. So, um, so I, moved, I moved from poetry to, to creative nonfiction but I still, as you hopefully can hear when I read, I mean, uh, there's still the lyric, there's a still lyrical quality to, to my prose. Um, despite what other people say, I don't consider myself a scholar. Um, I consider myself a creative writer. When I had my two Fulbrights, I always had a, to talk about this. Some people that have seen me, have heard me speak before, I always talk about, I don't see myself as a scholar, but I use a lot of research in my work and increasingly more so. Um, so I, I, I write for what I see as a general audience, not in a, a treatise or some, or, you know, or a scholarly work would be. So I don't, I don't, I don't feel bound by, um, footnotes and um, a certain way of, of, of ordering things to get to a conclusion. Um, I use more feeling. Um, here in Germany, um, people talk about disability studies, wanting to make disability studies a science, which I find to be kind of strange because I don't think of it as a science. Um, it's 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 an interdisciplinary thing, and it's and by it, by its own way, it's associative. Um, so I think that by doing that, you could also, in some way, grab people not through their intellect, but through their body and through their for the risk of being cliche through their heart, which I think actually makes a chemical change. Hope that answers somewhat. Thank you. I I do not see questions. I think uh, uh, I think we would ask you to put your questions in the Q and A uh, uh, section, which is at the bottom of the screen, and they should pop up for me. That how magic would work, uh, or perhaps there are no questions at the moment. I wonder if. I can take the liberty <laughs> in, in the meantime. Uh, I, was, uh, I was really, really struck by, uh, by a kind of almost like a mantra that, that you repeated twice uh, that uh, you said that during the pandemic and like thinking back to Nazi eugenics, which for me as a Holocaust scholar is also kind of foremost on my mind. And you said that uh, that is focused on the body, not the world in which the body lives. And you said, and you said that this is what causes this kind of individualism causes uh, causes the doctors and and everyone in the society to uh, approach people with disabilities as cure it or kill it. If we were to be in the world in which the body lives, how would that message change, do you think? Well, I think, an interesting question. I think that if, um, I think if the, if the, if the, if the focus becomes, take, is taken off the, the, the body and put on the society, then 
you're living in a an actual in an actually a, a more real world. I mean, you know, whether it's through globalization or interde I mean interdependence of of cultures, of societies, of people is is paramount. It's 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 really paramount. And this whole idea of individualism, which is so strong in the United States, but in throughout the West, but even more so in the United States, the whole idea of rugged individualism, mm -hmm. um, you know, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. So that terrible phrase that, that's used. Um, so I think that if you take the if you take the the focus off of the body and you put it back onto society, mm -hmm. you basically that's where the change really needs to happen. Um, so I think that by getting out of that old medical model and the you know looking at the world in which the body lives, I mean, I mean you know climate change for example. Mm -hmm. I mean there's a there's a, a there's a somebody here I know a, dis, a disability studies scholar here who basically has given up on disability studies because we're not going to be here <laughs> if we don't look at climate change and if that's nothing's done so it seems he 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 want he wants to deal with that um because it's it, it's the it's of the of the you know critical importance um so if we don't start looking at the at the the world in which we live you know the societies that's been created societies are created they're not just you know they just don't they just don't happen um you know um there's this myth in in Germany um, that a friend, a, a, a German friend, told me about um, the myth of the Nazi UFO, that the Nazi UFO came down in 1933 and left in 1945, um, and you know that's that's not that's not it. There's something there's something in our societies that you know have led to fascist cultures that still are leading to to fascist cultures. So without looking outside of the individual problem. Um, you know, that of any kind of difference that it's, it's looking outside. I think that changes, changes everything. Not that everything changes, but it changes the way we look at things. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have a question at me, uh, read it. Why do they want to make disability studies a science if it is the study of uh, disabled culture? That's a very good question. Um, I think some of it is because of where disability studies comes from in Germany is different from where it comes in, in North America. In North America, it's humanities based. And here, because of the way the academic system is set up, it's been living in departments like education or what they will call special education um, and in social work and in nursing, et cetera and so forth. So it's it hasn't historically been humanities based here. So I think that's part of it. And I think the other thing is that to get respect in the in the German culture, looking at it as a science makes it seem more um, uh, I don't know acceptable, um, more eminent. Um, so yeah, that's that's where I think it it comes from. Thank you. Um, I. I hope I'm not missing a question here because I don't see any in the chat. Uh, hope I'm, oh, oh, wait, uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I would like to ask about your work on the T4 uh, Action. Were you in Germany during the pandemic's worst days there? Were there associations made in popular media between the ways in which COVID ravaged care facilities there and the history of T4? Well, that's a good question. I must I must say that you know we're right now in the worst part of the pandemic. Um, Germany at the beginning was quite um, uh, it was quite the, the I mean deaths and hospitalizations were much lower here than in most other European and Western countries. Um, well, I'll just say that, you know, right in the middle of the pandemic, um, a similar situation happened in Potsdam, right outside of Berlin, that happened in Japan. Um, four people were killed in a, um, were killed in an institution by somebody who worked there. And what was interesting was the media 
was more interested in the person that did the killing than the people that were killed, which mm -hmm. I thought was, you know, <laughs> very, I don't know what word to use, <laughs> but they're very typical, I would say. Um, and disabled people started to talk more and write about how that wasn't, um, you know, uh, how that, you know, wasn't what should, what should be done. Um, I didn't see, I mean, of course, my disabled colleagues here and my friends who are disabled all saw the parallels. Um, I don't think I've read outside of that in, in what would call the mainstream people, you know, and I don't, my German is, is minimal. So I live in a bubble. So I, you know, I would have to ask my, my German friends more about this, but I don't think that was in the mind of people at all. As it would be my, my good guess at things and my, you know, I didn't, it would have been brought to my attention because people know I've been working on this book for so long. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, can you talk more about the notion of disability studies as a science? That would seem to suggest uh, there would be a methodology behind it. I'm interested to hear what you have to say on how disability studies necessitates interdisciplinary work. Also, can you talk more about disability in narrative? Uh, what you said about that was fascinating. Okay. Um... Okay, hey, let me sort of, it's, it's late for me, so I have to, my mind is, you know, <laughs> a little shaky. Um, okay, so yes, this whole idea of methodology. Um, if you're looking, what's also, also when you're thinking about methodology or science, historically science has not been very nice to disability and disabled people. So why would you want to reinforce that? It's basically looking at disability and disabled people as an idea, as a, as a way of, you know, again, as, as an experiment, as a, as a, as a, as a body of research. Um, so that's something that, that I think has to be looked at. Um, trying to think, what was the rest of the question? It's disappeared from my chat. About, about disciplinarity, where do you see a role of disciplinary engagement? Yeah, in yeah of course. I mean, it has to be because you, you have disability history, you have disability representation culture, you know, whether it's literature, film, et cetera, and so forth. You have, um, you know, the whole idea of, um, of, of, of a pedagogy that could be based around disability. So it just seems to be a natural thing where there, where it goes, you know, each discipline has its own thing to offer on a perspective of, of, of disability. Whereas if you're looking at it as a, through a, you know, through a, a rigorous methodological way, I think you're missing something. Um, not that, not that what's what somebody, not that you could just espouse whatever you want to, you know, say, and that it's true, et cetera, and so forth. But there's ways of going about it that don't have to be this um, following a, a path that has already been laid out in other disciplines. You know. Yeah. I have a question from Catherine Frazy, who says, "Kenny, it's wonderful to see you in virtual Nova Scotia." <laughs> and, and here's a question for you. You've had a wide range, <coughs> excuse me, of experiences in different cultures, the US, Canada, Japan, Germany. Do you have any observations about how these national cultures interact differently with disability cultures? Hi, Catherine. I wish I was there to see you. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, when I, you know, I was very surprised when I did my, when I lived in Japan and I researched about disability representation in Japanese culture, how some of the same Western tropes and stereotypes were there. For instance, the whole idea of the blind prophet, which we get in our, in Western culture was there in, in Japanese culture. I was very, very surprised to see that. Um, and I think that because I don't, I think all the cultures come at disability from the same way and they each have some 
different emphases for better or for worse, usually for worse. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not, opt I'm not an optimistic person. Um, and so um, I see that um, most of the things they're still, it's still medicalized no matter where they are, you know, all the cultures I've been in. Um, as we were talking about earlier before the, the event, Earl and I were talking about the various provincial laws, uh, disability you know, laws, disability rights laws in Canada, whereas in the United States, it's a federal law. And in Germany, it's a, it's a federal law as well, though in education, it's done by each, by each state. Um, but here, the, it really doesn't have much teeth. You can argue whether it has much teeth in the United States or not, but I think it has more teeth in the United States than it does there. Interestingly, Karen Nakamura, the noted disability studies scholar who's now at Berkeley in California, she's, she's Japanese and she, she thinks that the Japanese quota system, which I could explain to you briefly in a second, is actually more, um, is, is, is better for disabled people than the ADA, which I think is a fascinating thing. I mean, basically in Japan, employment, um, we have to remember that the ADA was really about the employment of disabled people and that the numbers have not really shifted. Um, you know, it's still, I think, still 36% of disabled people around that, give or take, are, are employed now. And the same thing was when the, when the ADA was passed, before the ADA was passed. It's, of course, it's made access um, to public transit and to things much, much better. Um, and you do have rights. You have rights where you can actually sue, et cetera, and so forth. But as far as employment is concerned, it hasn't really done its job. Whereas in Japan, they have a quota system where I forget the number, what it is now, but there's a certain percentage of, um, that have, of, a, of a company that have to have, you have to have employed but disabled people. And it's a little higher percentage for the government. And Karen thinks that it's, um, that it's that's a much better system. Um, but it's also interesting. I mean, I did some comparisons between the social security systems between the US and Japan. And both are medically medical model. In the States, it's basically about how much work you can do. It goes back to Nazism and eugenics. Um, you know, disabled people couldn't work, so they should be killed. Um, and uh, in Japan, it was actually things like, in quotes, how disabled are you? You know, are you missing? How many limbs are you missing? <laughs> that sort of thing, which is a a kind of a different way of, of looking at it, but it's still based in the medical model. Um, I mean, just the other thing, the other thing is just on a daily life, sort of, you know, uh, just a day-to-day -day living, Germany is uh, the, most, the most problematic culture I've been in as far as staring is concerned. Um, it is the most, it's so, it's so into staring at difference here and disabled people here that sometimes I don't want to go out of the house. Um, I become a shut-in, I always tell people, um, because I just don't want to deal with that. Um, so there are those kind of differences as well. I could talk on this forever, you know. <laughs> so, but. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Can you speak a little bit more about your museum work, uh, specifically the exhibit that uh, is coming this summer? Well, I'll just tell you where it I'll tell you, um, you know, what's the, the whole thesis of the whole thing um, for, for me is that basically um, queer history and disability history have a lot of parallelisms from uh, the ugly laws in the United States where disabled people were prohibited from being seen, you know, showing themselves in public to how public displays of affection, you know, uh, between same sex, you know, uh, people of the same sex is not, you know, was not supposed to happen in, in public or not supposed to happen at all. Um, the whole idea of, of the whole idea of normal, which came about through industrialization really wasn't used um, until the 19th century in industrialization. Um, also how disab disabled people and queer people were looked at you know, outside of this, this norm. Um, there's some confluence with the freak shows, which also has, you know, colonial aspects to it as well and, and, and racial and, and gender dynamics to it. Um, so there are all these, 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 these parallel histories 
that are never really seen together and how they, they work together as in othering people. Um, and so my idea was to do that alongside art that by queer disabled artists of the, of the past and today um, and how they interrupt that history and reframe that history. Um, I mean, one, you know, off the top of my head, one example, you know, Renaissance portraiture of these, you know, what that meant to people and how, it, you know, it, it, the physical attributes, um, you know, were, were people's characters and, you know, and personalities. Um, and you look at that with Riva Lara's work, for instance, her portraits, which are completely different of disabled from queer people. Um, so you you put those idea the uh, against each other as a counter history in a way. So it's basically because my co-curator always was asking why art? Why are we putting art in it? And I would always say you need the art to, to to show the the fusion and to take the parallels and put them together and also to counteract the the negative parts of the history. Thank you. Is another one. Uh... I, I'm mindful how tired you must be if you okay. could grant us a few more minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, the questions are just pouring in. Uh, you spoke a, a bit to the conflict that exists in intersectional identities with, with hypersexualization of queerness and asexualization of disability. Sometimes I feel that I exist at so many intersections that my existence has no mold to fit in and no model to follow. How can we understand ourselves communally, complexly, and interpersonally in the context of societies that are so focused on grouping and labeling the individual? So, <laughs> so another very good question. Um, I mean, it goes back to that, that quote from the Adrian Rich poem from Diving into the Wreck of a, of a book of myths in which our names do not appear. I mean, I always felt that, you know, when I was younger. I mean, eventually I found people, um, but I didn't have, I mean, I had to create role models. I mean, I came to Adrian Rich as a, as a, as a gay writer, not as a, not as a disabled writer. And then I discovered, oh, that's interesting <laughs> that she's, I mean, I basically outed Adrian Rich as a disabled person in staring back. I mean, that's, that's one of the things I'm very, very happy that I've done and that she was so open to it as well. Um, I think finding the role models and it's one of the things I've been trying to do in some of the projects. Um, I have a three-year grant from the Canada Council for the Arts, which are um, a multi-year, multi-project grant and all the pro proje uh, projects are collaborations, um, mostly with a generation of disabled artists younger than me. Um, and uh, I, I one of the projects is Disability Futures in the Arts, which is this series of essays written by disabled writers and artists who are coming from different cultures, from different, different intersectionalities. And I think I wanted to create, there'll be eventually 15 of them over th three years. I and mean, if there was more, it could be more expansive, but the funding is for three years. And so basically um, it's a place where at least disabled artists who have these multiple identities can go as a resource to find that they're people who have come before, there are people that have come, that are coming after, and there are people who are, you know, on the same plane and, ge and generation. So it's finding, it's trying to find ways to find these people. And I was, you know, I had this conversation with, with Carrie Sandall um, about how, uh, you know, when we were growing up and doing all this, there was no internet. <laughs> there was no, you know, I couldn't go on and look up, you know, I don't know, you know, uh, you know, gay, disabled, you know, Jewish man, writer, you know, I, I couldn't do that. I had to find them on my own. So now I think it's easier to find those, those connections. Um, but, you know, there's always a chance, you know, I, I'm, I'm always wondering, am I disabled? Am I gay? If I'm just dis disabled people, I'm the gay one. When I'm the gay one, I'm the disabled, when I'm going to gay group, I'm the disabled one, that sort of thing. And that's why I love doing this exhibit because I'm both and I bring both to the, to the table. Mm. Um, but I can't tell you in Berlin, it has been very difficult to find queer disabled people to with, with the experience of curation in the museums, you know, to, because we need them and we need them here in Berlin. I can't just hire somebody in Canada. 
um, because they have to be here to do the work. So, and they have to know German. So it's a whole, it's difficult. Um, how about, I, I see in front of me three questions and I will ask them as quickly as possible. And then I don't think we can impose on you any longer. It's very yes. late. <laughs> um, so, so just those three, and I'm sorry about that, but we will have to conclude. Um, so first of all, Kenny, this was a wonderful talk. Uh, this question relates to T4 and the pandemic today. Um, what, uh, during T4, where folks with disabilities and other marginalized groups uh, were murdered through state-sanctioned violence are erased from the global collective memory. I see these reverberations in our day and age where COVID uh, haulers folks developing long-term disabilities post-COVID treatments beyond the 99% survival rate being erased uh, as, as, the, uh, as, their ablest, as the ablest trope has folks believing you can get COVID and if you, uh, and if you are normal or healthy, it will be a cold. And if you have a worse outcome, it was your fault. What in your expert opinion is the best way to challenge these paradigms and dangerous ideologies that are being proliferated throughout social media and word of mouth? Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, that is a, a big problem. Um, a, a, a problem is not even the right word for it because it's a, it's actually a life or death situation. Um, mm -hmm. There's a there's people who are starting to to write about this, um, which is it's which is good to see. But that only gets one so far. The only thing to do is to have mass protest. It's late enough. I could just you know take off any, all my sensors and just say that without a mass protest, without you know, bring the, the, the attention to it through various actions, um, not, it, won't, it won't change because basically if you look at what's happened throughout COVID, I mean, whether things lock down, whether they don't, whether people go to school, whether they, it's all about capitalism, you know, <laughs> when you come down to it. And um, that's, you know, without, that's, the, that's unfortunately the frame within much, m m most of this is happening. So without tackling those, the big things like that and to keep pointing it out and to find, you know, to find ways of, of, of protests that are not, you know, let, let's face it, you know, writing letters is one thing, it doesn't help that much. You know, uh, you know <coughs> signing, pr signing petitions really doesn't do anything. It's people need to come up with some sort of uh, invigorated protest like ACT UP did. Um, you know, read Sarah Schulman's book, um, let, um, let the Record Show, about how, you know, basically ACT UP changed things um, for, you know, uh, for, for, you know, for people with AIDS um, early in, the, in, the, in, the, in that pandemic. Um, but it's just, you know, <laughs> the society is so medicalized that it's basically you know, whether it's elderly people or people with disabilities, that they're seen as, as expendable, you know. Um, and yet we have people like Peter Singer who are quote-unquote bioethicists who have, you know, chairs of things, you know, at, at Princeton. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and even when people say, oh, you know, we're going we're gonna to change the tr triage protocols at, ho at hospitals, and that went, came from the federal government in the United States, People are still being denied treatment because of their disability. Um, and because you know, it's bioethicists, which I think is a made up field, um, basically who are on the who work with the hospitals about this. And they come, most of them come with a, a medical and, and a ableist bias. Um, mm -hmm. So I wish I felt more, uh, I wish I could be a, not so doom and gloom, but it's hard. I mean, you know, I think mass protest is the only thing and, 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 and entertaining mass protest, you know, protest that really captures the imagination of, of the media, unfortunately, because we live in a media society that, that that's what needs to be done. Thank you. I will just read the last ones quickly, I promise. <laughs> Um, you mentioned one of the issues of the medicalization of disabled bodies is individualizing and removal from cultural context. 
how do you see creative writing as a mode for breaking away from these individualizing, divorced from context narratives? If, if that makes sense, I'm so interested in what you said about how this ability is intrinsically tied to stories. I mean, it's it's again, it's like just we ha we have to investigate what are these what are these narratives that have kept disability representation in the place that it's been in for so long. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a slight shift, um, but it's not you know as I said earlier in my talk, it, all it takes is one movie you know to come out and it's all you know it's it, all the work that that I do and the people that I know do is just you know it's like Sisyphus going up the hill. It's just you know. It's, it's, it's one step forward or two steps forward and one and a half steps backwards. Um, so it's basically, um, it's, it's looking at it, it's looking and asking those questions, but until people with disabilities are in positions of power, the gate, they're in the positions of being gatekeepers of the culture, things will not change. And you can look through, you know, Canada, you can look through the United States, you can look through most cultures, there are not many. You can't name it. I can't find an art critic who is a dis disabled in a mainstream publication. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, you know, that's, you know, in, 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 so you don't have those people. The New York Times had their disability series, which is now no longer. They have columnists of all kinds. They do not have a disabled columnist who, you know, I mean, yes, Frank Bruni became disabled, but he's not, he's not really identified as a disabled person. And what they did was they shoved it off to basically a fellowship. You know, they didn't, they didn't hire a disabled columnist. And that shows you, you know, that you just don't have these, you don't have, you don't have the voice where you need them, need it to have, uh, where we need to have them. And until those, the cultural gatekeepers, editors, you know, reviewers, uh, you know, people with money, that sort of thing, foundations who give out grants, until the people in power are not disabled, you know, if they're not disabled, this is, nothing will change. Hmm. Disabled people need to be not only at the table, but the power. You know, the McDowell Colony, the prestigious artist colony, got a group of disabled people together for a virtual residency. And I made a suggestion that, you know, how to, have more disabled people besides the physical access of the place. That's something that that's known that has to be taken care of. How do you get more disabled artists, you know, to 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 have residencies in McDowell? And I basically said for a couple of years, just have all disabled people on the panel. People looked at me like I was, you know, just like what absurdity. I said because disability is such an intersectional identity, you can fill out all the other the other thing. You can have African Americans. You can have you have women, you could have Latinx people, you could have native people, you could have all that. But if they were all disabled, you know, then maybe something would shift. Thank you. Yeah. And maybe the last one, um, which of your identities do you find the most challenging or the easiest to stand up for politically? Uh, as I've been called by people um, close to me, I'm the Nazi trifecta. I'm gay, disabled, and Jewish. Um, I, I say that because there's a piece that answers this question better than I can in the, the time here. Um, if you look up Kenny Fries and the Jewish Book Council, I wrote a piece, a very short piece called the Nazi trifecta, which I talk about that. Um, and so each one has its different aspects to it. Um, so um, I could end with, well, no, I'll have you go read that. I won't give you the, the funny story that that's, that that's based on. But I do think that as far as making change, disability is probably the hardest. Because as I say in the introduction to Staring Back, you know, which is you know, 1997, so it's 20, you know, it's a long time ago, um, that basically, Disability is a reminder of people's mortality, and that we're 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 that, that re disability reminds people of death and mortality, and nobody wants to deal with it. It's so deep rooted that I think it is the one of the toughest ones to change is 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 ableism. Okay, but, but read but read the Nazi trifecta. Read the piece. It's oh, it's yeah. kind of funny actually. It's one of the few funny things I've written. <laughs> 
<laughs> thank you. Um, I cannot thank you enough. And I'm just so delighted to see you. I hope I we won't wa wait another four years to see each other. Yes. And uh, also a standing invitation to come to Nova Scotia. This pandemic will allow that eventually. And you have given us so much of your time and energy. We are so grateful, Kenny. And uh, I know you deserve a rest and we will continue these conversations. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Dorota. Good to see you. Wonderful. Bye -bye. To see you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have a lot of messages of thank you and how wonderful it was in the <laughs> chat. Thank you so okay. much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.